Hello everyone, um, my name is Lisa Bunier and I will be talking today about Fourier series and free transforms and how you can study a signal by um, going into the Fourier space by studying its frequencies. So in this notebook, uh, you will find both classes material and also all the materials that you need to uh, work at home on different problems. I only made one document so that you can find everything at the same place. Um, and in, in this Jupyter notebook, uh, the classes material, they will be written in black. Uh, all the examples that I'm using during this class will be in blue and all the problems that you will have to solve are written in red. Uh, so we can start by talking about uh, Fourier series uh, and the decomposition of signal into frequencies. Um, so I think what is best to do is to start by looking at this video that I found on YouTube. Um, I'm going to remove this sound and make the speed much higher. So we have a Y axis and the x-axis uh, that represents the cosine of the theta that is uh, shown by uh, the green points and the y-axis that represents the sine of theta. Theta goes from minus infinity to positive infinity and if you look at uh, a one-dimensional space, and you will s what you will see the sine wave. If you look into two-dimensional space, uh, that you have um, circles. Uh, but we will stick in this class with the one-dimensional uh, data, uh, which is the sine wave. Sine waves can have different amplitude, which is the coefficient that you find in front of the sine function. You can also uh, change the phase of the signal by adding a constant into the sine function, and you can also modify its frequency by modifying uh, the theta value. Now what happens if we are looking at the sum of two different sine functions with different amplitudes? Then when we add them together, uh, the result will still be a sine wave um, that will have the typical frequency of the two sine waves that are the same with a different amplitude. Then if you consider that the two sine waves have different phases, um, the sum of them will still be a sine wave. Um, in the in the one-dimensional space, as you can see there. Um, so as long as the frequency of the two sine waves are the same, um, then they will still be the sum will still be a sine wave, which is something very interesting. Then you can consider the sum of two different sine waves with a different frequency. That you have the second one that has a frequency that is uh, higher than the blue one. Then, in this particular case, uh, the resultant function will no longer be a sine wave in the one-dimensional plane. Um, so, by adding sine waves at different frequencies, you can actually create signals that have different shapes. So, I think you know where I'm going, uh, which is that if you add a large number of sine functions uh, to each other, then you will be able to represent any kind of function that you like in the one-dimensional space, which means that any function can be approximated by the sum of sine functions. Uh, for instance, here you have like a step function, which goes to minus one to one, and go back and forth, which is periodic. Um, and by adding multiple sine waves, as it is shown here on the screen, the more you, sine waves you add, the closer you get to this step function here. Um, so this is the first example that we're going to try uh, to do. Now let's look at the definition of Fourier series. So Fourier series are used to reproduce or to approximate a signal, a function, uh, that is periodic, um, and it's, this approximation is made by adding a constant value uh, with um, a given number of sine function or cosine function, which is approximately the same, 
Uh, and the more sign function you add, the closer you will be to your uh, real signal. And if the sum is infinite, which means that you have an, you, you add an infinite number of sine waves, then you will be able to reconstruct uh, perfectly the function that you want to reconstruct. This formula of the Fourier series uh, can be rewritten as this one uh, in order for it to be more convenient to use. And you have the different coefficients that are written uh, just below. So in order for you to understand better, um, we can take this example uh, with this function f, which is a step function that goes to 1 between uh, 0 and pi. And its value is 0 between pi and 2 pi. And this function is periodic um, over 2 pi intervals. And we can calculate the different coefficient a0, an, en uh, of the Fourier series formula. Uh, by taking first the integral of the function between 0 and 2 pi uh, over one uh, periodic periodicity. Um, it's the same as taking the integral between 0 and pi as the function value is 0 uh, over pi. Um, and so a0 value is 1 and a half, when, um, is 0 0.5. Um, considering the a n parameter, we have to integrate the function times the cosine, um, uh, times the cosine, uh, which gives us sine of n pi divided by n pi, and we have similar thing for the b n function. And then we can try to approximate our function by its Fourier series. Um, by taking a0, so 0 0.5 plus the sum um, of, uh, of this, this expression here. So let's try to calculate this for you, sorry, and see how it looks like depending on the number um, of sign that we want to add together. Ideally, uh, we would add an infinite number of sign functions in order to represent the signal at best. Um, but here we just want to see what is the effect of adding one sine function, two sine function, um, and whatsoever. Then what we want to do is to represent both uh, the f function and the different approximation by the Fourier series of the f function, depending on the number of sine function that we will use. Um, so first, what I will represent is the f function. Uh, and I chose to represent it uh, on four, um, four period. Uh, this is done by this expression here. And then I will add um, the different Fourier series, first by looking at only uh, one uh, sine function that is used to compute the Fourier series. And what you can see is that by using only one sine function, of course, the result is a sine function that goes close to one um, when the, the f function is close to one, and that goes close to zero when the f function is close to zero. But of course, uh, the fit is far from being perfect. Then if we add, for instance, we go to three component in the Fourier series, sorry, and uh, then what we can see is that uh, this time it's the orange line. We go closer to um, to our f function, and then if I go to multiple components in the Fourier series, it gets even more interesting. For instance, the clo the, the the larger the number of sine function you add together, uh, the closer you get to uh, the actual function that you are trying to approximate. For instance. Um, by adding more than 100 sine function together, you get very, very close to the function that you wanted to have. Okay, so that was the first example. And uh, then we can look at another one, for instance, which is a continuous function. Uh, we can try to approximate. Um, uh, it works the same. For instance, this is this function, uh, which is represented by the black line here. And you can see that by adding together multiple um, sine functions you are able to reproduce very well um, the, the, the function that, that is f, the f here. The example that I've shown here where um, we were trying to reproduce, uh, to approximate one-dimensional functions by a sum of sine functions, 
Uh, you can also do that in the two-dimensional space in order to reconstruct surfaces. For instance, here, uh, the example that I show is the 2D Fourier approximation for hyperbolic paraboloid uh, surface. Um, you have the function here. The surface is given by uh, the red grid. Um, and you can see here by adding uh, multiple sine functions that are trying to approximate the, the red grid pretty well. And if you add even more sine function, which is presented here, then you are able to reconstruct the surface very, very well. Everything that I've shown so far concerns periodic functions. So Fourier series transform a periodic function into a discrete exponential or sine and cosine function. Um, for non-periodic function, however, Fourier series are not applicable. Instead, what we should use is called Fourier transform that will convert non-periodic functions into continuous frequency domain uh, functions. And I will show you how you do that. Um, so here, I think we can go back to our video. So in the case of periodic function, we only did certain frequency of sine waves, um, and if of the sine waves has a measurable and a given amplitude. Uh, but it's also possible to generate non-repeating waveforms, uh, for instance, one step or an exponential function, and can be done by adding sine waves together. But sine waves of every possible frequency uh, may be needed, um, and also, their amplitude might be uh, as infinitely small as possible in order to reproduce non-periodic functions. So Fourier transforms is a way of splitting a signal, um, no matter if the signal is periodic or not, into sine wave functions. And the definition of Fourier transform is written here. Uh, as the integral over all the real space of the function that you want to approximate times this exponential that depends uh, on given on, on the frequency at which you, you're looking at. Um, so for instance, if we want to try to get the Fourier transform of this function, which is the cosine of 6 pi times x, we can represent this function at, uh, in this diagram here uh, and then we can try to calculate its Fourier transform. Uh, so in this particular case, our function is periodic, and the parent is 1 over 3, um, and we will try to recover this periodicity by using the Fourier transform. Uh, so the formula, that if we apply the formula, we get this expression for, a the, for the Fourier transform of the f function, uh, and we can decompose it by uh, using the sum of exponential. And at the end, what we obtain is that the Fourier transform of this periodic function um, is the sum of two direct functions at the frequency minus 3 and 3. So as shown by this particular example, uh, if the function is periodic, then the Fourier transform is a sum of direct position at different frequencies. Then I, uh, um, I think what you should try to do is to get the Fourier transform of this function, which is the same, but by using the sine, the sine function instead of the cosine function. You can try to enter the different step of the calculation as I did here. You can enter it there in red. Um, and I provided the solution for you, so you can uh, check your calculation. And you will see by doing that that even function as the cosine function that we have been studying, they have a real Fourier series. Whereas odd functions, such as the sine, the sine function, uh, have imaginary Fourier series. Um, so in general, what we use is the absolute value of the Fourier transform uh, to take into account both odd and even components in the signal. Uh, so in the rest of this presentation, when I will speak about Fourier transform, what I mean is actually um, the absolute value of the Fourier transform. Um, and what we can see here, for instance, is that if we add two periodic signals, F1 and F2, uh, this create a periodic signal, uh, F1 plus F2, which is not a sine function. And when you take the absolute value, 
uh, of the Fourier transform of the sum of the two functions, then what you see is two um, direct function, if I might say that, uh, position at the frequency of the first and of the second uh, uh, signal that you have been considering. The function we have been looking at so far are continuous function in the time domain. But in real life, when you observe something, for instance, the light that is emitted by a star, uh, the signal that you receive is discrete. So what you actually need to compute is not the complete Fourier transform that I, that I would have been using so far, but it's instead a discrete Fourier transform. You have here the general expression of the discrete Fourier transform, which is basically discrete uh, the discrete version of the Fourier transform. Um, and so in order for you to understand how it works, uh, you can write a function that we will call DFT, uh, which takes in one argument, which is the, the, the time story, um, and we calculate uh, the discrete Fourier transform following this formula and return its value. Uh, and I suggest to use the same function as before, uh, and they give you a sampling rate, so we all have the same thing. So this is uh, the, the function in the time domain, and this is the absolute value of the discrete Fourier transform that I obtain. And the question that I ask you is that, do you recover the periodicity of uh, 0.35 approximately uh, by using your discrete Fourier transform function? And I'm also asking you uh, to try to think about why is the discrete Fourier transform uh, mirrored uh, in this diagram? So you've wrote your own discrete Fourier transform function. Uh, but in general, what we will use instead of writing our own is a fast Fourier transform algorithm. Uh, those algorithms are used to reduce the computational time of the discrete Fourier transform. Uh, for instance, if I take the same function as you just did, and I use, instead of using a handmade discrete Fourier transform function, I use this NumPy fast Fourier transform algorithm. I obtain uh, the exact same thing with the exact same periodicity that comes out from my signal. Fast Fourier transform algorithm is supposed to be way more efficient than any homemade discrete Fourier transform function. Uh, so I, I think it would be great for you to try uh, to see the difference in the computational time of your discrete Fourier transform versus the fast Fourier transform that is implemented, for instance, with NumPy. Um, and so this is uh, the problem that I suggest you to do now. Then what I think is important to notice is that Fourier transform can be reversed. Um, doesn't depend on if, whether if uh, they are continuous Fourier transform or discrete Fourier transform. Anyway, you can calculate um, the original signal from the Fourier transform. Uh, here what I show is the use of a discrete Fourier transform uh, on uh, this signal, which is still the same function as before. Um, I represented in blue the original function, and in red is the inverse Fourier transform of the Fourier transform on the original signal. And we can see that they are almost the same, and on the right what I represent is the error between the two, which are which is very, very, very low. So just keep in mind that, for instance, if you have a Fourier transform of a signal, that you can come back to the original signal. And this is something quite important. What is very important to take into account when calculating the Fourier transform um, are observation effects. For instance, um, you can observe an object for a limited time, and the duration of your observation will impact the result on your Fourier transform. Uh, for instance, here what I represent is the Fourier transform of the sinus function defined on different intervals. Uh, so the first one is the very short signal, uh, the second one is a little bit longer, and the last one is the longest, of course. And the bottom are the fast Fourier transform of the different uh, signals. Um, and you can see different thing. Uh, the first one is when the signal uh, is short, uh, you have less points in your Fourier transform, 
uh, which is because the resolution and frequency inside uh, fast Fourier transform or Fourier transform is directly correlated to the length of your observations. Uh, so the longer your observation, the more the, the better the, re the resolution will be in the frequency domain. As a conclusion to this, uh, the duration of the time series matters a lot. So the longer the time series, the better the resolution in the frequency domain will be. Um, and then when the, the number of period of acquisition is not an integer, um, then you can have artificial signal resulting uh, into um, frequency component into the fast Fourier transform. Um, so what we represent here on this diagram is uh, the sum of two um, two signals, two periodic signals, and their uh, fast Fourier transform at the bottom. What you can see is that as we add m more observational points to the data, uh, then we're able to uh, get better and better results into the fast Fourier transform uh, with the Peak getting higher and and, and the, the its width uh, being reduced as we add um, uh, more and more uh, points into the observations. So if you are if if amplitude do matter for your project, like you want to compare the amplitudes or of of a peak into different objects that are similar frequencies, you cannot really use um, fast Fourier transform to do that because the amplitude doesn't mean anything. It it really depends on the length of your time series. So if you do care about amplitudes, um, then you have to use what we call power spectrum densities or PSDs. Uh, because this this thing is uh, normalized to the frequency bin, uh, which means that the duration of your time survey will not matter um, when you try to uh, estimate the amplitudes in the in the Fourier domain. So the definition of the power spectral density, I uh, put it here. It depends on the Fourier transform that has been squared. Um, and everything is normalized by uh, the frequency bin. So if I show you an example here, what I represented are um, this function, so like a sine function uh, on a very large number of, of bins, a uh, lot of points. Um, and I've computed both the power spectrum density and the fast Fourier transform for um, these two functions. They are the exact same, but taking on a much larger number of points on the bottom panels. So what you can see is that for the fast Fourier transform, the amplitude of uh, the, the peak in the Fourier domain varies a lot um, when you, you add more points into the time series, whereas it's much lower when you have less points. On the contrary, uh, when looking at the power spectrum density, we can see that the peak have the same amplitude in both cases. So remember that fast Fourier transform, um, the amplitude doesn't mean anything, it's not something physical. So if you want to compare different signals and compare um, how, how uh, a given frequency matters in your signal, um, then you should use power spectrum densities instead. Another observational effect that I want you to think about um, is the effect of gaps into time series. So for instance, here you have a signal like a sine signal that is continuous. And in this case, uh, some data are missing. There are, for instance, some time where we, you weren't a, a, able to observe your target. And so you don't have data for it. So we set everything to zero in that case, for instance. And I want you to um, compare the, for, the fast Fourier transform of two different data sets, one without gaps and one with gaps, um, to see what is the effect of these gaps on uh, the estimation of frequency in the fast Fourier transform. I'll show you here the result. We can discuss it later. It's just so um, you have uh, more information about how you can, uh, what you, you expect to find. And I think now it's time for us to look at real data. So um, what we're going to look at are time series that are taken by the Kepler satellite um, that observed stars for about four years. 
We are going to look at this particular star. This is its identifier, kick 3541346. There is an article that, that studied this star if you want to have a look at it. Um, and, and what this satellite do is that it observes the star continuously for like four years and the observation is divided into quarters, um, 18, 17 quarters uh, for this particular target. Uh, what I'm using to download the data, you don't have to know about it, uh, it's called Light Curve. Um, so I, I, I wrote everything that concerned this software and how to get the data back. Um, and what we will want to do with this star is try to estimate its rotation per year uh, as stars rotate and, uh, you know, like sunspot as the, like star spots at the surface of the star. Uh, we'll turn around the star as the star, the star rotates and by studying the light emitted by the star, the function of time, we can see the fluctuation of the light that is induced by the spots, uh, which help us uh, measure the rotation rate of the star. So that's, that's the basic idea. So uh, first I will download the data for the star. Okay, so we have 17 quarters. Um, so this star has been observed by Kepler. Um, and then we want to represent uh, the data. So I'm downloading all the time series. So this is like a normalized flux. You're going to need to know the units as a function of time. And you can see that uh, in this data set, there are a little bit of gaps. It corresponds to the time where the satellite has readjusted itself to keep the star in the field, for instance, or it can be something else. Um, so we cannot apply directly a fast Fourier transform on this data set because the time, array, like the, the, the array that described the time uh, is not even in space, we have gaps in it. So the first thing we have to do is fill those gaps with um, constant value to create a regular time grid. Um, and in our case, we're going to fill it with value of one because it's like um, the, 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 the main value of this time, sorry. So this is what I do here. Uh, I don't think I need to go too much into detail about that. You can have a look if you want. Um, and then what I obtain is this time survey where all the gaps have been filled with one value, constant one value. So now we have an evenly spaced time grid and we have our time survey. So now we can compute the fast Fourier transform of this time survey. So I take the time resolution, uh, I have a certain number of points, and then I compute the fast Fourier transform of the flux that is emitted by the star, and I also uh, give the array of frequency on which I want it to be um, calculated. And I represent here on the left the fast Fourier transform as a function of frequency in day minus one, and you can see that you have uh, a peak that emerged from, from the signal in the fast radio transform domain, and this peak corresponds to 0 0.9 days. Now, the right panel is the exact same thing, uh, but I've reduced artificially the length of uh, the time survey to show you that, once again, if you have a very short observation, then you have um, the resolution is not as good as if you have many, many observational points. But still, uh, we are able to see that there is a periodicity into our data, but this periodicity is a little bit lower than what we had with a very good um, time series, a good length of observation. Um, and if you look at the paper that I mentioned, uh, which is, if I remember correctly, VIDA and uh, 2014, you will see that um, the rotation period that this star that they measured is about 0.9. So with a very simple fast Fourier transform, without doing much to the data, uh, we're able to uh, recover this rotational period that is 0.9 days. And we can check uh, how it works on the data. Here are like uh, the first 1,300 uh, observational points, for instance, and I overplotted vertical line um, at the given periodicity that we observe um, by using the fast Fourier transform and where we can see that it matches the periodicity of the star very, very well. Okay, um, 
I can ask you one question about that, um, maybe to, to let you think a little bit about it. What does all the other peaks represent to this fast for your transform? Um, we can discuss about it uh, when we see when I see you in a few weeks. Uh, but just try to think about that. What does it represent here? Okay, so I guess now that is your turn to work a little bit. Um, so I've shown you how to measure the rotation period of a star that has been observed by Kepler by using the fast Fourier transform. Um, I would like you to try to do the same on another star. I give you here its identifier. It is Kek 10515986. So yeah, your turn. And finally, uh, what I would like you to look at um, is something a little bit more complicated, not that much. Um, we'll try to estimate the mass and the radius of a star that has been observed by Kepler by using asteroid seismology. So here what I represent is the power spectrum density of a, a star that has been observed by Kepler, for instance. And you can see that there are many different signals into this power spectrum density. At low frequency, we can see uh, the peaks that are due to the spot modulation um, induced by uh, the activity of the star. And this spot, uh, this spot signal show us the rotation rate of the star. So this is exactly what we have been doing so far, trying to measure the typical frequency uh, of the rotation of the star. But at higher frequency, you can see other things. You can see, for instance, the granulation background, which is due to uh, all the convection cells at the surface of the star that makes the luminosity of the star change a bit in time. And you can also observe a small bump here that is due to stellar oscillations. So stars oscillate due to sound and gravity waves that propagate and resonate in their sphere. Um, and they make the star oscillate at its eigenfrequency that depends on its mass, on its radius, and on its age, for instance. So this is something that we can observe in the Fourier domain. Um, and if we have a closer look at these oscillations, so this is a zoom on the PSD here, uh, you can see that um, we observe kind of a Gaussian shape excess of power in the power spectrum density. Uh, that we can characterize by its frequency of maximum power new max. And we also observe that the signal due to the oscillation of the star is very periodic. Uh, you can see that there is a given periodicity into the power spectrum density that appear very clearly. Uh, and this, um, this periodicity, uh, we call it delta nu, is the large frequency separation. Um, and those two parameters are very important for asteroid seismology. Um, the reason why is because there is a, re a direct relationship between the mass and the radius of the star and those two parameters, the, the new max, so the frequency of associated with the maximum power of the oscillation, and delta nu that is associated with the periodicity that we can recover into the power spectrum density. Um, so I give you the two formulas here, and I want, what I would like you to do is to try to measure, um, so to represent the fast Fourier transform or the PSD, doesn't really matter for this project, of this particular star that has been observed by Kepler, and to identify the different component, the granulation signal and the oscillation frequency. Um, I would like you to try to measure the frequency of the maximum power of the oscillation, so this is new max, and then to measure the large frequency separation, which is delta nu, uh, and then by using those two formula to try to measure the mass and the radius of the star um, by using those asteroid seismic scaling relations. This is how we call them. Okay. So now that is your turn to work. Um, please save all of your questions for when we meet in a few weeks. And I hope you enjoy it and I hope you find uh, all the problem interesting. <laughs>